Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this Real Town Planning Institute's webinar on urban planning and displacement. My name is Olafin Taiwo. I'm a chartered planner and the chair of the Young Planners Network of the Commonwealth Association of Planners. I'm also a member of the RTPI General Assembly and also a member of the International Committee. Today's event will bring together a diverse perspective on urban planning and displacement in different humanitarian response and post-crisis settings. We will hear from researchers, from practitioners, and also from responders. Um, a need to strengthen synergies between humanitarian and development practice has been formalized in the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus in um, 2016. And that is when the RTPI joined the Global Alliance for Urban Crisis, which is a multidisciplinary collaborative community of practice working to, the, to address the urban implications of humanitarian response. Um, planners work in different humanitarian and development organizations, and they work across different levels, local and international level, local and international government. However, urban planning, the expertise that urban planning bring is very critical to development and is critical to different actors in the displacement settings. Engaging with planning can pose challenges, as we all know, but it also comes with the opportunity to help navigate and improve the humanitarian outcomes and pave the way to local sustainable development. Our speakers today will share experiences best practices, challenges, opportunities, as well as innovations. We will discuss practical approaches in, develop, in, in displacement settings. We will discuss innovative approaches to urban data collection, the process of adaptation and transformation, including the adaptive management. We'll also have case studies uh, from experiences um, in Jordan, Ukraine, Syria, Kenya, and Bangladesh. There is a chat button function on your screen. When you click on it, you can go to the question and answer function to ask your questions. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of all the, present the speaker's presentations. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible, uh, given the time that we have. Um, may I introduce our speakers? Uh, the first on my side is Jonathan Weaver. He is a partner at Urban Logic as a senior urban planner, a consultant at the UN Habitat as well. Secondly, we have Melissa y, y. Meyer. She's a doctoral candidate in regional and urban planning at the London School of Economics. She's also a former information management officer at JIPC. We have Usam Alwaya, who is a reader in architecture and urban planning from the University of Dundee. And we have Rami Shama, operations director for World Urban Vision. Finally, we have the RTPI International Policy and Research Officer, Mikhail Vialeno, who would give some final remarks at the end. Um, I'll encourage everyone to stay till the end when we will be showing a closing video that has been gracefully prepared by one of our speakers today. It's titled A Story from the East, where Uzam Alwaya tells a tale of urban tragedy and triumph. And it's set to music with illustrations from artist Helen Zugab and a poem by Roni Bokstros Jalka. Uh, without much ado, I'm very much pleased to hand over to Jonathan to give us the first presentation. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I will just share my screen. Bear with me one second. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so yes, uh, as Olifan uh, introduced, my name is Jonathan Weaver, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the team's experience on uh, urban planning for areas hosting displaced populations, um, and share some insights on how the work aims to support local government and municipalities to identify opportunities for sustainable urban development under what's termed uh, is of the um, 
humanitarian development peace building nexus. So uh, to give you a little bit of background as to why uh, at UN Habitat we think urban planning is so critical uh, as a platform to enable sustainable development, I'm going to touch on a bit of data. Um, in 2019, of the more than 82 million displaced people, there are around 26 and a half million refugees. I'm particularly referring to refugees in relation to the case I'll share in a minute. Uh, this figure is more than doubled in the last decade as a result of conflict, violence, persecution and climate change. From a humanitarian perspective, uh, the question on response is pro predominantly about protection, life-saving activities and basic human needs. From a development perspective, simplifying a bit, but the question is often what happens next? Uh, the term that we refer to uh, is often durable solutions. So in terms of options the, for, for these durable solutions, the two most commonly cited solutions are return to country of origin or resettlement to a third country. As you can see from the pie chart on, on the top right, uh, the, the problem is, is how difficult it is to achieve that. With more than 1%, well, sorry, less than 1% of refugees uh, returning to, to the country of origin in 2019, and less than 0.8% of refugees being resettled to third countries. So therefore, for us, the challenge is, what are the prospects for the remaining 98%, um, of which 86% are hosted in developing countries, which are often those who are most rapidly urbanizing. Uh, the question for the international community and human habitat has been how can this be addressed to deal with rapid, uh, rapid urbanization, work with governments hosting large numbers of refugees to realize inclusive development, and at the same time provide longer term and more hopeful prospects for the large numbers of, of, of displaced people. So, um, additionally to this, there are a couple of trends which are driving another aspect of the rationale behind this. First of all, the increasing number of protracted crises globally, which affects the increasing demand for humanitarian and development funding. Uh, additionally, as we mentioned, rapid urbanization and influxes to urban contexts in low income countries where uh, local authorities struggle already often to provide basic services, uh, therefore face even larger challenges when de uh, dealing with an influx of displaced people. Put together, a coordinated and planned uh, intervention to respond to this is, is really critical we feel anyway. Uh, two examples you can see on the screen uh, uh, represent a cycle of well-intentioned but often short-term responses which culminate in costly and unsustainable long-term situations. In Somalia, uh, we, we, we've encountered a lot of piecemeal interventions that are unlikely to be sustainable. Delivering services is very costly and inefficient, so we, we need to look at an alternative approach to that. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, in the response to the Rohingya crisis, we see a huge number of actors, extremely limited space and er uh, many, many actors tripping over each other to implement in, in sort of an uncoordinated, uncoordinated way. So it's really important we see to take stock very soon into the emergency response to understand where medium term and long term interventions will be needed. Uh, so that said, in, in, in most contexts like this, many actors, activities, etc., uh, and varied sets of data uh, particularly when the price crisis becomes protracted or into the long term, inhibits clarity um, or a common understanding of the long term issues, um, as well as a limited spatial understanding of the situation, limiting the ability to, to implement effectively. Uh, and this often then results in a lock in of spatial inequalities and, and as we said before, unsustainable paths of development. Uh, so. In brief, uh, UN Habitat uh, and the team I work with, we often use this diagram to explain in basic terms what we're aiming for as part of our assessment or profiling work to build a response, uh, medium term response. This aims to, to uh, respond specifically to crises and, and displacement context to rapidly provide a baseline by which to retroactively initiate planning processes to help more effectively target investments, primarily in infrastructure to, to improve living conditions as well as management and service. Um, so for us, we see it's very important that a common evidence-based consensus of what needs to happen uh, is really important to help target implementation, uh, uh, let's say, proceed better. Uh, this needs to take into account, obviously, where humanitarian activities are taking place, but also what's happening in the wider context. Uh, for planners, is obviously really critical. And we see this as a way to ensure that interventions add value way into the long term and help build a case for implementation that includes hosting communities and the managing authorities or local governments. So um, I'll briefly touch on a case study in Kakuma, where the team I've been working with for a number of years have been focusing uh, in northwest Kenya. 
Um, you and Habitat has been working there since 2016 under a multi-agency framework led by the Turkana County government, um, supporting spatial planning and infrastructure to build capacity on urban planning and management, as well as to develop spatial plans and pilot to durable shelter and infrastructure. Um, some quick key stats. Uh, the settlement is protracted in nature. What that means is that it was developed originally in the early 90s to, to house a few uh, thousand Sudanese refugees, um, but is now uh, grown into what is the fifth or sixth largest population center in Kenya, with more than 160,000 refugees from South Sudan all the way across the Great Lakes, Ethiopia and Somalia. Um, and adjacent to, to the, set, the refugee settlement is, is a town of more than 45,000 people. Um, it's therefore together the largest population in all of northern Kenya and has an annual economy of worth uh, worth more than 56 million US dollars. The host population has grown, uh, uh, let's say has doubled uh, in the last 15 years and the refugees have, have doubled in the last 10. Uh, so in our responses, uh, it's really key uh, that we engage with government at the starting point. That's the UN agency's mandate uh, at national, county and local level. And it's really critical for the project to have impact. Um, and of particular note in Kenya uh, is how important the devolution and empowerment of local government has been. As there are, and, and we see this in many cases that, that they're often the ones at the forefront of dealing with displacement. Uh, Turkana County government, uh, who we work with closely, have been some of the biggest advocates for this work, with refugees being explicitly included uh, in the development plans, which means that they're committed to inclusive development, but also allows for budgeting to be made for infrastructure um, so that, you know, the settlements can be linked up and integrated both between the host community and the refugees uh, into economic systems and allow the hosting communities and refugees to access uh, wider socioeconomic opportunities. Uh, and crucially, this also means that there is an ability to help build capacity uh, from, from international donors, et cetera, uh, both in the humanitarian and development sphere, so that you know you can start to look, talk about municipal revenue to allow for infrastructure investment to be affordable in the future, and then also for service provision to be shifted from humanitarian actors across to local authorities for more sustainable, uh, let's say, solutions. Um, What's also uh, critical is to have a really solid understanding of perspectives from different stakeholder groups all the way down to, to the, the local level. Um, and the engagement process that we often work with from project inception all the way to validation and approval um, across a number of the, the sort of sub projects we, we work on um, is, is our engagement with community planning groups uh, who represent both host and refugee communities and are really key to our ability to, to let's say, address social inclusion. Uh, the community planning groups represent diverse, uh, let's say, locations across the settlement area. Uh, they are aimed to ensure gender parity, uh, varying age groups uh, and ethnicities. And we also uh, set out objectives and ex expectations and roles and responsibilities in a terms of reference so that we can engage in a, a long term dialogue across project development uh, to, to make sure that we are really representing the needs from the ground. Additionally, uh, data, uh, hard evidence, is really key. Uh, Melissa, I think, will we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but from our perspective, it's really essential to understand how a settlement has come to be the way it is and, and how uh, we can also capture a lot of the work that's done by humanitarian actors. Because a lot of data and, and uh, data gathering and information is already there. It just needs to be consolidated and spatialized um, with, with gaps, obviously, to, to be filled in. Um, for us, it's critical to ensure that the data is spatially focused or can be spatially illustrated, as this helps to ensure that the effect on the territory as a whole is considered. And this may include the wider district or administration, administrative region. This then enables, or let's say enables, uh, a process of looking wide to identify the challenges and opportunities, and then zoom in on making concrete recommendations in an informed way. Um, of course, uh, in all sort of humanitarian situations, the, situ the situation remains uh, sometimes uncertain of, in terms of the future. Uh, and, and therefore, in order to chart the path forward, the data and analysis from the communities, as well as the alignment with national policies, um, we, we set out scenarios to consider what are the, that, that, that consider, should we say, uh, key variables that affect both sustainable development and urban planning looking at the outcomes which could influence the direction of the area's development, 
um, and then see what the scenarios could be out of the, 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 the combination of variables that we consider, um, looking at how they would affect the area um, and how probable it is and what the impact would be spatially. So an example here was to compare a positive scenario against a sort of business as usual, uh, considering, for example, if the population growth uh, remained at the, the current levels, and if all that growth was accommodated within planned infill and extensions, uh, and there were substantial investments in uh, interventions to minimize the impact of climate change. And of course, it's really important that, important that we also spatialize the representation of this uh, to be able to discuss it with the, the community stakeholders, the government, um, as well as uh, UN agencies and NGOs who are very key to also implementing infrastructure in the area. So um, currently, the team are working on finalizing a vision for the future as part of the county government's initiative to confirm municipality status on the area, which includes the regeneration of Kakuma camps, development of an, an EEZ, uh, and to allow for uh, coordination of investments more strategically uh, from both the humanitarian and development sectors, as well as from the, municip the, the, the national government and county governments under the municipality, um, and form part of a wider strategy that enables sustainable growth that's resilient, green, inclusive, etc. cetera. Um, so obviously the, the work is, is ongoing uh, and not without substantial challenges. And we're also now working in, in other contexts where we face or where we're working on sort of similar themes, including the DAB in, on the other side of Kenya, as well as working with um, other municipalities uh, hosting refugees and IDPs in Jordan, Egypt and Cameroon. Uh, I'll drop some links into the chat after after this. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for your time. Look forward to the discussion later. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jonathan. That was a really um, a helpful start and it actually gives us a really nice overview from the urban development side. Um, uh, my name is Melissa Weimeyer, um, and I am a PhD student at the London School of Economics, as Olaf Ayan said. Um, my background is, in a way, the opposite of Jonathan's. So I really came to looking at urban planning for displacement contexts um, from work experience in migration and displacement issues, um, and have found over time how critical it is to better understand how cities work so that we can uh, collaboratively respond to urban displacement. So um, what I'll be doing in this presentation is giving a brief background in the work that I was doing before starting a PhD. Um, so that was with the Joint IDP Profiling Service. Provide you a few examples from the various um, projects that we worked on. Um, and then finally, give some ideas and provocations for what I think the role of urban planning should and could be in displacement contexts, as well as the potential challenges that planners might face in doing that. So the Joint IDP Profiling Service is an organization based in Geneva that supports governments, development, and humanitarian partners to collect information specifically on internal displacement contexts. So Jonathan gave us a nice overview of the latest uh, trends and figures on refugees um, from his presentation. He also had included a, a figure on the internally displaced population. So that would be those that have been displaced, so forced to leave their place of residence um, as a result of conflict, human rights violations, natural disasters, generalized violence, and other reasons such as development projects. Um, but that have not crossed an international border. So I'll be focusing on internal displacement in this presentation. Um, what we did with the Joint IDP Profiling Service, uh, over four years I was helping to design and implement large-scale data collection exercises to assess displacement scale, scope, and impact. So concretely, the idea was that that would help all the partners better understand the needs of those internally displaced populations 
to inform their responses. But a common characteristic of contexts affected by displacement is fundamental disagreement, sometimes over the existence of any displacement and other times over the extent of its impact and also what to do about it. There also tends to be, as Jonathan mentioned as well, an alphabet soup of actors all trying to collect their own data to inform their very own specific slice of programming. So there's a lack of an overview and there's competing data sets and ideas of what's going on. This can lead to mistrust. And frankly, um, it can lead to some, some pretty ineffective responses. So implicitly, the goal of the Joint IDP Profiling Service was to build a collaborative process around the data collection so that actors can analyze the data together. And that helps them trust the data to reach consensus over what to do about it. And so with Jonathan, we agree that having a complete evidence base is really important, but I'm really zeroing in on the challenges involved in having that. And so the idea ultimately is for better, i.e. trusted and more complete evidence base, um, that has been demonstrated to lead to more collaborative and effective, i.e. tailored responses to displacement. So taking a quick look at the approach that GIFS uses for data collection, um, it really comes down to spending as much time on the actual implementation of the methods. So for example, a large scale household survey as it does in all the prep work that it takes to get to that point. Um, there is a toolkit available on their website and I can post that link uh, later in the chat um, that gives a variety of tools and guidance for how to do this. Um, what uh, we end up doing is spending a lot of time bringing the stakeholders together under one process from the very beginning and focusing on the process as much as the results. So it's not just what findings you get from the, uh, from the data collection at the end. Um, it's actually who's been working together over time so that they come to consensus gradually over trust in that data. Um, now, putting this in some historical context, um, traditionally the response to a mass displacement, whether refugee or in some cases internal displacement, was to build camps with the idea that people would get basic services in the camps and be able to go home once the conflict has quote unquote ended. Um, we will have some interesting examples from camp settings from our other two presenters. Um, but we also know that with general increases in urbanization and conflict and violence taking place increasingly in cities, the majority of displaced people don't live in camps. Um, it's become common knowledge maybe around a decade ago that the humanitarian sector was unprepared for this new reality and didn't know how to respond, leading Jeff Crisp and colleagues in an issue of the journal Disasters in 2012 say in cities, the humanitarian community is outside of its comfort zone. However, I'm happy to say that the humanitarian sector has started to acknowledge this and is working to adapt. For example, in 2010, we had the first issue of the forced migration review um, on adapting to urban displacement. And a follow-up in 2020 showed a much more nuanced understanding as well as examples to draw on. Um, of course, uh, Olafayan had already mentioned the founding of the Global Alliance for Urban Crises in 2016. Um, and this network was instrumental in establishing principles for working differently in cities. In 2018, UNHCR addressed their own shortfalls in this area by dedicating a full High Commissioner's Dialogue on Protection Challenges to urban displacement. But um, despite that, there is still a long way to go, and this issue actually risks falling out of the spotlight. So my own work um, went sort of organically to working at the city level um, from working with primarily central level actors. Um, so here we're working on a countrywide profiling exercise of the internal displacement situation in Honduras with the Ministry of Justice in Honduras. Um, 
That said, there was a real need to better understand the priorities and data gaps at the city level. So as my first example, um, the city of San Pedro Sula in Honduras, they knew that their district had the highest levels of displacement, but they didn't know about what people actually needed to start prioritizing the city's response. So UNHCR brought together local government with members of their police force to start this conversation. We discussed the general situation of internal displacement throughout the country and then compared this with what they were seeing in their city specifically. That discussion showed me some really interesting uh, dynamics within this group. Um, it showed me that while some members of the local government had a clear view of what was practically needed, with cases of desperate families asking for help to find housing or safely enrolling their kids in schools, others just kept repeating, but they're just like all other migrants, right? Um, to them, this phenomenon was pretty much indistinguishable from economic migrants, um, or they considered it to be non-existent, really questioning, are people being forcibly displaced from their homes? Is this really happening? It showed a misunderstanding of displacement among some of the urban service providers, um, suggesting a need for training to bring local actors onto the same page before anything else can move forward. So UNHCR and the Norwegian Refugee Council um, did put in place a big awareness raising campaign to help with this. And San Pedro Sula's humanitarian assistance response plan is in the works as a result. They started pilot studies in 2019. Looking at a very different context, um, Eastern Ukraine is not a situation of generalized violence, but of internal displacement caused by conflict with a separatist government that forced over a million of people out of their homes since 2014. Um, and many people fled to nearby cities that were more agricultural and were hence not prepared to absorb such a large population so quickly. So when discussing with local partners which groups to prioritize in data collection, there was some interesting disagreement on where to start. Humanitarian organizations like the Ukrainian Red Cross wanted to focus more on pensioners and children, so who they considered to be the more vulnerable populations, whereas some of the local government actors wanted to focus on the working age population. At first, this surprised me um, until they explained that they were very concerned about local revenues and hence wanted to make sure to provide services that would retain or even attract working age populations so they could increase their tax base to be able to support those that couldn't work. These differences in priorities made complete sense in that context. And yet it was really important for us to come together to have that conversation for them to come to light. Um, and then it set us up really nicely for reviewing the findings together in the end to identify the ways to address the needs of those different population groups. Um, at this stage, there have been some really important local integration plans developed, even if the central government has not yet um, been able to move forward with their, um, their overall strategy. So we will be hearing more uh, from Dr. Al-Wair and Rami about Syrian displacement. Um, so I'll go through this example quite briefly. Um, when we were looking at the situation of those internally displaced in Syrian cities in a partnership with an NGO called IMAP, as well as others, um, we created a methodology for assessing the functionality of different systems. This meant analyzing damage to areas of the city and matching this with the numbers of IDPs expected to be found there to determine which areas and type of infrastructure were the most important to rebuild first. This experience demonstrated to me just how new this type of analysis was to certain humanitarian actors that were present at this training. Um, who tended to specialize in just one type of programming, like providing shelter. Um, working on the example of certain cities also demonstrated the importance, um, in fact, uh, just how critical it was to have a conflict analysis be the basis of any, uh, any other kinds of discussions around data and around the situation, as well as where to start reconstruction. Um, of course, the decision on where to start reconstruction would be seen as highly political unless 
participatory method, methods could be used to make those decisions more transparent and, um, of course, just. So that brings me to just a few ideas on the role that urban planners could have in uh, internal displacement contexts or displacement contexts more broadly. Um, first, I believe urban planners are fundamental for creating a paradigm shift to plan for mobility. That means creating plans that account for large influxes um, or outflows of populations, whether it's because of internal or international migration or through sudden and forced displacements. Second, urban planners are well-versed in finding a balance between people and place-based policies. Um, the dilemma of developing policies that target individuals and policies that target areas such as neighborhoods or districts is still a struggle for humanitarian decision makers. I actually see this as the center of the challenges within the humanitarian development nexus. Third, um, through the existing links that urban planners have with local governments or even the private sector, um, the, their involvement can help build government trust and buy into any data collection or response process. Fourth, planners inherently build partnerships, and these are essential, as Jonathan has also showed, um, to bring together scarce resources and to avoid duplication and parallel systems of service provision. Fifth, urban planners can be strong advocates for incorporating the concerns of those displaced, as well as the challenges of displacement affected areas into local development plans. So those can be formalized on paper for everybody to see. Without this, displacement tends to be addressed as, quote, those people that will hopefully leave soon, as opposed to, quote, our people that we can integrate into our cities better. Um, sixth, housing tends to be the biggest and most immediate need of displaced populations, and infrastructure to support informal settlements is often a close second. Um, these are the bread and butter of urban planning and development practitioners. So I do see a, a huge benefit to bringing them on board for that kind of expertise. Um, that said, the, these opportunities are coupled with challenges. Um, my main message here is that there is such a thing as building expertise on displacement. And urban planners don't necessarily have that unless they're willing to do the legwork of learning about the politics behind displacement. So the first and biggest challenge is being sensitive to those politics. Um, this affects the second, uh, which Jonathan also mentioned. So the responses often face a lack of resources and the hardest hit areas lose out the most. And as he mentioned, those spatialized plans can maybe highlight which are the actual hardest hit areas so that people can be aware of where they're responding and where they're not responding. Um, third, infrastructure projects are all well and good, but they do not in and of themselves lead to the integration of displaced people. This requires holistic interventions such as legal advising, psychosocial support, community building, and jobs, to name a few. Um, fourth, as the case in Syria shows, conflict analysis is imperative even when doing a seemingly straightforward infrastructure project. Fifth, uh, of course, data collection is often highly sensitive and problematic, um, so urban planners and local governments often need to make decisions with high degrees of uncertainty, hence the benefits of things like scenario planning um, and other methodologies for dealing with uncertainty. And finally, we wouldn't be talking about this if we had all the answers already. The examples and best practice are limited, uh, as is the research, but the emerging interest in this topic does give me hope. So to conclude, the local governance of displacement is political, it's challenging, and yet does offer many opportunities for the skills and capacities of urban planners to contribute. And I hope through my PhD to also bring some conceptual frameworks and imperial cases, empirical cases to help move this forward. So I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, hello, good, afternoon. good morning, everyone, and thanks for giving me the opportunity. I believe you hear me, aren't you? 
Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. So my name is Hussam Alwer. I am based in University of Dundee. I am reader in sustainable urban design. I am going to look at the camp itself from place making perspective and the role of when how the top down meets the bottom up for cre creating what I call it a hybrid transformations for one of the largest uh, Syrian camp in the world. In fact, it was one of the largest Syrian camp with around now 80,000 inhabitants called Al Zatari camp uh, to the very north of Jordan, very close from the Syrian border. We need to, to when, it, when it's come to the refugees, we need to bear one thing in, uh, in mind. Refugees at the end of the day are a human being. So crisis, war, it doesn't erase humanity, culture, pride, or even sense of hope. So that's to me is a crucial statement when it's come to talking about camp and camp design. This is the location of the, the, the camp itself called Al Zatari because it's very close from a Jordanian village called Al Zatari itself. It's about seven or eight kilometers to the, the to the south of uh, Syrian border. As I said, it has about 80,000 inhabitants. Very important something to, to refer to here uh, that 90% uh, of the inhabitants came from one city uh, and it called Dara. It's uh, to the uh, north of the uh, Jordanian Syrian border. Now, why this statement is important? Because those people came from more or less the same culture. And that's really affect the way they shape, eventually, uh, the, the camp themselves. Some very qu quick statistics about the camp. It has 80,000 80, uh, uh, inhabitants. Uh, around, by the way, half a million refugees have passed through the camp. So that's quite important as well. About 60% of the, the inhabitants are under 24. 20% of the, of whom are under five years old. Now, one thing's upsetting about the camp, average of 80 bears per week. 80, be, uh, 80 bears per week and around 14,000 weekly consult consultations. The camp cover only about 5.3 kilometers square and it has around 12 hospitals, around 24 or 28 community centers and about two big hospitals. So in reality, it become a proper big town, I could say, or a city in, in some people. What I found it interesting about the camp and unique, how it started with a very top-down vision from the humanitarian agencies working with Jordanian government, because you remember those people are dealing with the huge influx at some point. They're dealing with emergency, with very limited resources. So they, there is no time at, to, for consultations with community by then. So the decision to create the camp at, uh, 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 in 2012, it really was very top down. Two or three people created the decision. Uh, it started with tents and some tents catch, uh, caught some fires and some refugees lost uh, their lives. And then the camps, uh, the camps uh, leaders and mayor, I could name him later on, Mayor, he dis I called him mayor, by the way. He decided with help from, uh, from agencies to bring what they call it caravans. Now, you might tell me why caravans? Because Jordanian government was so afraid and scared from the fact that, wow, if we start bringing cement materials and start establishing foundations, that might lead to permanent solutions. Hence, the government was so worried from the fact, no, we don't want to repeat the Palestinian experience. In the fact, now, all Palestinians camp in Jordan are informal cities, but they are very established. So hence, they created those, they allowed the camp leaders to bring caravans where they are easy to uh, assemble, but easy to disassemble if needed. And the, the camp was donated by uh, Japan, Korea, and some Gulf states. It cost about $3,000 only. And it is only uh, 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 three by five. So it is only 15 meter squares. But what I found it interesting, if you look at this picture, to the left-hand si uh, side, uh, side uh, uh, left pictures, wow, caravans with the roads. And to the right-hand side, oh my goodness, 
very sophisticated. It become the camp over time, uh, or very sophisticated with different materials being introduced and kind of informality, satellite on the, on the roofs, water tanks and so on. So I got excited to understand why that's happened and what has happened. This is the map of the camp itself. It is three by two. It's exactly three by two kilometer. So it's, it's really about 5.8 kilometers square. Those who are familiar with Dundee city, that's by the way, the size of the waterfront. So just to show you the dense and how dense it's, as you can see, it follow a very grid style, military style. Why? Easy to, to, to set up, uh, to, deal with, to do with safety, crisis, and also food and water provisions. So this is why the, the camps follow really a very military, how can I say, standard. To give a credit to the mayor, he split the, the, the master plan into 12 districts and he use kind of code and design code in each district in the sense there is a certain population for a certain services for a, 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 a certain uh, uh, facilities food and and uh, uh, water as well uh, services so this is the, the 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 master plan itself wow look at the camp right now look how sophisticated and informality you don't see that rigid structure introduced earlier. Hence, I am happy to say that, to give credit to the mayor, he allowed himself that negotiation and relationship over time between the top down and the bottom up. If you look at the middle of, this, uh, at the, middle of the, the pictures, this is the very famous street now in the camp with more than 3,000 shops owned by the refugees, the refugees created their own local economies. And I have a lot of story to tell how they created this. But what is important, if you look at the middle of the camp, there is a big French hospitals. On the back of it, this street called now Sham Zilize. Sham Zilize. Sham came from Syria. And Zilize, that's named from the, the French uh, famous street. Well, what is important when it's come to camp design? There is a problem. Sometimes we feel as if refugees is a, a homogeneous mass. And then in reality, it is not because they comprised and they came from uh, comprised of individual with different levels of knowledge and different needs and expectation. I really like this, uh, 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 the, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Why? Because interestingly, time is very important. When, 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 when the, the refugees arrive to the camps, regardless, by the way, whether that's in Al Zatari or elsewhere, they come to start with, they, they are asking for basic needs, psychological needs, safety, food, water, security. But when they start moving from temporality stage and they feel, wow, we are really here, it's going to stay for longer time, they start seeking different kinds of needs, the psychological needs like belonging, loves, a relationship, uh, esteem needs, prestige, feeling accomplished. And actually, over time, some of them, they want to have kind of self-actualizations, -actual being creative, inspiring, created, creative activities, a creative economy. And I would like to demonstrate that through evidence. I would encourage all of you to look at how a United, Nation, United Nations, through different organizations and the humanitarian Agencies, they follow uh, the, the, uh, how they build camps. They follow what I call it a very top-down humanitarian strategy, focusing on really target units and focusing, focusing on how to cope with, with, uh, 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 with, with emergency. It is really kind of, I could say fair, it's fair to say it follow one size fit approach to all because there is no time and the resource is very, very limited. For see how exactly they use this kind of design code for for a family, uh, one tent or one caravan, community eighty, and then against that you have the water uh, uh, tab and the refuse drums. So this is exactly how they design the camp. By the way, this is uh, everywhere more or less. So it really, it is it's really fun, follow what I call it a very command. It's all about control, very fixed in the state, but also kind of very complex, so there is no flexibility on it. Now, wow, so this is the top down. Let me show you over time 
when people felt, wow, we're moving from temporary stage into kind of, wow, indefinite, permanent stage. How the placemaking, the informal placemaking start moving. When they start, people start trusting each other. They start moving into an act of collectivism where camp inhabitants see to help each other as partner. They become really partner in adversity. So they start transforming. That's uh, the, the camp itself through a really hybrid uh, environment of daily negotiation between materials, between spaces, between even social uh, 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 dynamics and negotiation. As, so if you look at these pictures, what I found it interesting, how over time the refugees establish relationship with the tracks who, who serve the camp daily, and they start smuggle illegally this, uh, 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 this kind of materials in order to establish different kind of environment, privacy, but also insulations to insulate the, 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 their caravans against uh, uh, the harsh weather. And look at the typology they start introducing, how they start merge and, and wield the tent with the caravans, with the corrugated uh, metallic stuff. And over time, the, soon they, the, the more they feel comfortable with their space, they start uh, uh, gaining through negotiation with, with top down and bottom up, start establishing, uh, uh, occupying more spaces and more uh, uh, places. So this, this is just showing the, the different hybrid typologies from a very basic caravan to more complex social clusters. This picture, by the way, is a real one. I draw it myself. Just look at these pictures. It really remind me with the, the old city of Damascus, old, the, the old uh, uh, city of Homs, but even Dara'a, where those people come from. Look at ha the hybrid and the courtyard, and it's all to do with, by the way, uh, environmental issues. It's all to do with the privacy. Look how sophisticated and this kind of informality. Look at the high street they established themselves. The high street, by the way, become their own living room. It's become the extended living room now. And all 80 to 85 percent of the caravans now are linked illegally to the electricity. And of course, the, the camp must be uh, the camp leader must pay the, 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 the bill every month to the Jordanian government. They establish even what I call it, how placemaking become a, a, a psychotherapy. It's become a real attempt from the re refugees to listen and ex anxiety by reproducing the familiar, producing patterns of, ever, for, uh, of urban living that resonate with their recent past and recent experience. This is one of the refugee. He established this lovely courtyard with this fantastic fountains. Look at the decoration and detail. And by the way, recently there is around 65 fountains in the camp itself. So this is the different typologies. Apologies, I don't have time to explain, but just to show you the different typologies and the housing inside the layouts how they managed to make most of the materials, despite the fact Jordanian government put a huge pressure on not to bring any materials could lead to permanent solutions. But equally, unfortunately, over time, place making, place making become a competition where those with power or resources back in Dara, they managed to establish good businesses in the high streets. And they, by the way, they have their own governance systems. So they start renting some of the caravan out to some refugees where you have to have two signatures and witnesses. But those who couldn't afford or they don't have resources, they struggle a little bit and they are still based on, on, on the money coming from uh, uh, the, the aiding agencies. This is one of the, the bak baklava, baklava uh, uh, shops starting with two or three refugees. Now that's shops now own uh, own more caravan with about 60 people, working with 60 people, and they start uh, 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 importing the, the baklava to Amman, the capital city. So interestingly, the, the camps itself start really becoming a free economic zones where there is a lot of good products and the cheaper products. So my conclusion, and apologies if I am running off time, we do need two relationships. 
We need the top down. Absolutely. Why the top down? The top down, they have the resources. They have the governance. They have the power. But equally, we need that great relationship with the with the with the community and local community because they know how to 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 get to self to 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 collaboration and self organize. But also, they have the emergent solutions, the adaptable solutions, and sometimes they have a simple rules to play. So that's I will finish with this slide, and that's me myself. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hassam. I think uh, you have put this in a very good perspective for uh, what I will be talking about. Can you please confirm if you can uh, hear me well? Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, I will be speaking today about the uh, coordination mechanisms or in general about the coordination in fragile context uh, in which Lebanon is uh, very well known of. I will be speaking about our organization's approach in terms of adaptive management and uh, what we as World Vision in Lebanon uh, have done throughout the last few years in terms of, uh, of this adaptive management. Uh, but just to start with, uh, a little bit of a perspective on where Lebanon is now. Lebanon uh, actually is in a place where we have four crises. Uh, that are uh, intertwined, interlinked, and happening all at the same time. We have the Syria refugee crisis, uh, in which Dr. Hassan started with, uh, that has an impact on, uh, on, on Lebanon, and it has started in 2011. So we are in the 10th year of, of this crisis, uh, and this is where a prolonged, uh, sustained uh, humanitarian crisis uh, is in place. We have the economic crisis, which started in 2019, October 2019, but uh, the uh, the main impact was in 2019, and its consequences continued up until uh, this day. Uh, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which started February 2020, and of course, uh, everybody knows about the explosion that took place in Beirut on August the 4th uh, in 2020. So uh, in all of these uh, four crises, we have had different experiences. We have had different uh, uh, collaboration mechanisms. We have had different successes and lessons learned. Uh, I'm going to be just talking from a practical perspective about the different successes and the different lessons learned from, uh, from those coordination mechanisms that we've had throughout the last 10 years and probably more in also previous crises. Uh, the first one is uh, in the successes is the objective of life-saving activities. Uh, the whole idea that the coordination mechanism should always put the uh, people's needs in front, in front of all of the other needs, especially their organization's needs. And whenever there is this kind of consensus on putting the people's uh, priorities uh, as top priority, then lots of things related to bureaucracy and related to the challenges uh, in terms of coordination uh, will be dealt with in uh, in a much better way, in a much, of, a much more efficient manner. Uh, the second thing is that whenever we had an emergency in terms of coordination, uh, we used to ask ourselves, uh, do we do it? Uh, the question that we always talk about is not whether we do it or not, it's how we do it. So we go from a principle perspective. Is this something that is present as needs in the community? Is this something that us as humanitarian communities or international humanitarian agencies, we need to intervene to be able to support the communities in need? If yes, then we talk about how we can, uh, how we need to respond. Uh, but the main question is not whether we respond or not. And this is part of the cultural uh, change in point three. Uh, it's related to how we think, how our mindset is in, uh, in all of the emergency interventions, but also whenever there is this embrace from uh, coordination mechanisms and the people participating in the coordination mechanisms, 
uh, there is embrace embracement from uh, from our end, then coordination is much easier. Uh, and this leads to to the fourth point in which there are two strategies that we normally used in different uh, in different interventions. The one is top bottom approach in which the leadership of the organizations agree together that there needs to be a coordination mechanism. There needs to be more uh, coordination on the field level, and this is that cascaded down uh, to the team level or to the field level. And there's the bottom-up approach as well that has worked in different uh, interventions uh, also. When the field teams have good relationships, then on an advocacy level towards the uh, government or towards the UN agencies, there has been more coordination from the uh, country directors whenever there was uh, this coordination present on a um, on a local level. Uh, the last point in the successes is the development programming. Uh, as World Vision, we have been present in Lebanon since 1975. So throughout the all of the crises that we have been responding to, uh, it was quite clear that in the areas and in the communities that we have sustained development uh, programming, it was much easier to directly shift into an emergency intervention support the communities that are in need on basic needs on uh, the priorities that are present uh, at that time and then do the transition again into development this was quite helpful instead of restarting or starting in a, a new community in which uh, the organization is not present in in terms of some lessons learned uh, one of the major lessons learned, especially in the Beirut uh, explosion response, uh, was the uh, deduplication exercise. We noticed that within the coordination mechanisms that was, especially at the beginning of the response, everybody wanted to help in the community. What happened is that many families got different kinds of support from different kinds of organizations. And there are families which did not get any uh, any kind of support. So there has been ser several uh, tries to do deduplication exercises in which each organization that needs to provide a certain kind of support, they go into uh, the beneficiary list with the UN agency or uh, depending on who is leading the sector. Uh, and then we do a deduplication to make sure that the families who we are wanting to support have not received uh, any kind of support from, uh, from other organizations. Another lesson learned is the structures. So as you know, within the Syria refugee crisis, we have something called the Lebanon Crisis Response Plan, which is a, a mechanism that has different sectors, different working groups, different uh, kind of coordination mechanisms. And we try to do parallel uh, mechanisms when the Beirut explosion uh, took place and this did not work. So what worked more efficiently is that when there was the umbrella uh, coordination mechanism and then the Beirut explosion response was kind of integrated within the already existing uh, mechanisms. And this is something that we have noticed has made a very big difference in terms of coordination of efforts from the different uh, actors. Uh, at the same time, there is a different mindset that we need to understand when dealing with a prolonged humanitarian crisis. We cannot look at the Syria refugee crisis the similar way that we look at the Beirut explosion, the similar way that we look now at the economic crisis. Uh, there are interventions that require basic uh, or direct basic services, and there are interventions in which we would need to look at it from a midterm or longer term perspective, very much similar to what Zatari Camp has, uh, has achieved throughout the years, but in a more coordinated manner. And definitely, when we talk about the coordination, there needs to be this kind of support from the government perspective uh, whenever it is possible, uh, for sure, whenever we are talking about uh, emergencies. Uh, there's also within the mindset, uh, we've had this several times in which we uh, face, you know, the idea that we have the funds, we have the human resources, but we are not able to support everyone. And this is a fact. Unfortunately, none of the organizations is actually able to meet all of the needs of the people whenever there's an emergency. And this is something which we cascade down towards the teams. 
And the mentality is that we try and help as much as possible. Whenever we are not able to provide the support, we always need to find an alternative uh, on where this family can get the support needed. Uh, not necessarily us as an organization, we need to take care of all of the needs. And whenever this mentality is, is there, people start also uh, having to coordinate with each other so that referrals can, uh, can take place. Uh, with respect to the point before the last, uh, the urban interventions, we always need to take an, uh, uh, into account the uniqueness of those urban interventions. You know, there's a different environmental impact when we talk about urban interventions in emergencies. Uh, the cost of the interventions is definitely different and the coordination mechanisms are more or less more uh, present, more effective, more efficient normally in the urban context, especially in a prolonged uh, crisis. And at the same time, the vulnerabilities, they differ very much from, uh, from between urban contexts and, and rural communities. And whenever we are talking about vulnerabilities, just to note that in any fragile context, there's a very big change in the uh, definition of vulnerability. We are not able to look at vulnerability now, for example, in Lebanon, uh, we are not able to look at vulnerability the same way that we used to look at it in 2018 or even uh, before. There are different criteria because of the different crises and the impact that it took place on or it, uh, it forced on the Lebanese, the Syrians and the Palestinians who are present uh, in the country and the migrants and whoever the impacted population is. So we need to look at vulnerabilities and understand it from a different perspective than normally the theoretical uh, knowledge or the theoretical tools that we have. What did we do as World Vision? Uh, we, what we did is that in 2019, we launched an exercise called the contingency planning. And here we know that contingency planning normally takes place on a grant level, on a pro project level. But what was very important for us is the contingency planning on a department level. So we're looking at contingency planning from an organizational perspective and not from an intervention perspective. So we look at our presence, we look at all of the departments, when we look at HR, we look at uh, procurement, we look at admin, logistics, uh, finance, etc. And all of the, the organization needs to put con contingency planning. This is based on scenarios. So uh, my colleagues before, they mentioned scenario planning. Scenario planning is something very important. We take the worst case scenario and the best case scenario. We, take two, we took two scenarios at that time and we started building the contingency plans based on the most, most uh, projected scenario that we might face in the country. Then we did something called con context monitoring. We set certain set of indicators. These indicators, they measure for us how we are moving towards the scenario that we have put the contingency planning in or with. And then based on this, we see whether any of the uh, plans that we had put, they need to be executed or not. Uh, at that time, because it was the economic crisis in 2019, we did planning or we did revisions for the plans on a quarterly basis. Unfortunately, this day, when we were talking about our business continuity uh, within last week with the fuel crisis present in the country, we said, okay, quarterly updates, this is not, uh, this is not going to do us any uh, good impact in terms of programming. We actually need to uh, revise it on a monthly basis because the, the situation is changing dynamic. And so we had to adapt even our contingency planning and we had to adapt our approaches to make sure that we are uh, in line with what the country is going through. And definitely in all of this, there's the umbrella of risk that is present in which we need to have always a discussion and a different, uh, a different you know, meetings between different departments on what are the risks that are present in the country and how this is impacting our programming and what, uh, what can we do to mitigate the uh, the consequences of those risks. So for us, this was adaptive management. Uh, it was not 
set in stone. It was not written anywhere. It was not something that we had uh, anticipated that we would be doing. We definitely have uh, different tools within the organization which we have used, but we even had to adapt the tools to be able to accommodate with the situation that we are uh, that we were going through. On a last point, one personal takeaway from all of this, you know, experience throughout the last years, and it's normally I, I'm a person who likes quotes, so I always say that whenever we prepare for the events that uh, take place, okay, but we also need to prepare for the surprises within our responses. Because of the intertwined responses that we have, we had to adapt even with the responses that we had prepared and planned from before. And it's a mindset. It's a lifestyle that we need to change to be able to deal with the dynamic situation happening in fragile context. Planning is something very important, but being prone to or being embrace or embracing the actual change that is taking place in the situation will let you be more successful in adaptive management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, all the speakers for this, this has been a very, very insightful presentation. Um, we'll go to the question and answers. Uh, could you please, if you have any questions, you can just put them down in the question and answer section on the chat button. Um, the, the first question that we have here is, what are the challenges associated with complementing people-centered approaches with place-based approaches? So probably, Jonathan, do you want to start with that? Or, or okay, yes, you can go ahead. The way I see it, there is no one size fit approach, as I said earlier. It really will be different from context to context. If you look at the Syrian crisis, I remember in Jordan, in one day, in one day, the, the Zatari camp must cope with 10,000 inhabitants. 10,000. So what I am trying to say, sometimes there is no way to have a place-based solution at the beginning. This is why some, you know, I don't want to be very negative. Sometimes in some cases, to deal with the emergency and the crisis and with the influx, you may have to start with the top down. But the way I found it interestingly as well, top down eventually over time must complement the bottom up approach. I am afraid to tell you Zatari was very unique case in Jordan because there are other two camps and the Jordanian government refused to let the, 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 the refugees to take over and com, co convert the camp into an uh, informer. So there is another thing. I, am, I, I do feel sorry sometimes to United, to UN humanitarian aid people. Why? Because by the law, those people must operate under the governments. How can I say? Whatever government they, they are in, they must operate under their rules. So United Nations don't really have rules in Jordan. So it's really very complex. Thank you, Usam. Um Yes, Melissa, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. So I, I totally um, understand Dr. al point, especially in the case of the Zatari refugee camp. Um, my work in internal displacement has been more protracted situations, so not immediate emergency. Um, and in those situations, we can account for bringing in place-based and people-based um, programming if we make sure that our data collection methods allow us to do that. So um, an example of the way that we do that is using a comparative approach in our household surveys. Um, so that would mean not just surveying the displaced population, but also surveying the local population that has not been displaced to try to understand what are the ways in which those that have been displaced are struggling more than the neighbors living around them. 
And that acknowledges the fact that some people who are in displacement situations, let's say um, informal settlements in the peripheries of Mogadishu, are all living in really challenging, maybe informal areas. Um, but there are specific ways in which people that are displaced might be facing additional difficulties. For example, higher rates of eviction um, because they lack security of tenure or having fewer um, social networks within uh, certain informal areas or within the city to access jobs. And those are the opportunities that we can, uh, humanitarian and development partners and government together could potentially do more targeted uh, people-based interventions for those specific issues um, and then look at the broader informal settlement um, to implement some place-based policies that can benefit everybody. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that for now, but I think it's a great question. Thank you for raising it. Thank you. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I won't extend too much because I think Melissa and, and Dr. Awar have, have uh, mentioned or let's answer this very well. I think the only thing I would say from my perspective is, is which perhaps aligns to both the, the two comments already, is understanding that uh, for, for, for people and place, you need to look at frameworks that respond to an overarching system. Uh, and working with government is really important for that. So you actually allow things to be implementable. Uh, because if you don't do that, it, it, there is no sustainability. It, it can't be taken on. And then I think in order, once you have that framework, the targeting aspect becomes really important because then you can start to see how do the pieces sort of slot together and you actually then have um, uh, some kind of strategy that becomes not, implement, not only implementable, but responsive to, to, to the locality. And so to me, it's, it's always, a, it's always a, a kind of balancing act, actually. Uh, there is no right answer, but being able to respond to both the grassroots and the top down, which I think Dr. Awar mentioned very well in, in his presentation, I think is absolutely key. And being able to have engagement with, the, let's say, the stakeholders at both those levels in a meaningful way is a, is a critical part. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll just go to another question that we have. Um, we have a, in the published section of the question and answer um, chat button, it says, do you think planning expertise can play an active role in overcoming the tensions between humanitarian principles and development objectives in a displacement setting? And also, which key skills should planners develop to address such tensions? I remember, um, was it Melissa, you mentioned that there is such a thing as expertise in displacement. Uh, yeah. So, If if I may if I may say if I may say uh, we need to bear in mind always camp design associated with what are one things hostile environment like it or not hostile environment it must be host, hostile environment from government the host the host uh, uh, how can I say the government why because the soon the government eventually wants those people to go back to their own country. Hence, if you look at the camp in Al Zatari, it is in the at the heart of the desert, very harsh weather, no infrastructure, no drainage infrastructure. Yes, I know I, I may have showing you a nice pictures of how, how people being adaptable, but it is still hostile environment. In Lebanon, I'm sure Rami will agree with me. It's even worse. I really feel sorry for them. Those who live in Al Zatari, they live in the heaven, comparing with the one million displaced refugees in Lebanon. It is absolutely hostile environment. Yeah. yeah so uh, then the question would be: How can urban planning uh, be the be the solution? What is the need? Is there a need for urban planning expertise? Um, Melissa, Melissa, are you aware about it? Mm. Yeah, I, I know I mentioned this in my uh, my presentation. I would actually love for uh, Rami to, if you could tell us a bit more about what you saw as the expertise that helped some of those coordination mechanisms be put in place in, in Lebanon, in Beirut. Um, my sense is that urban planning itself is divided into a whole variety of different functions depending on which context you're working in. Um, I see a need for the technical expertise that urban planners bring for the specific 
programs that could be put in place. But I also see a need for the broader coordination skills that urban planners need to have in order to coordinate with their different uh, local government offices, um, as well as bringing in communities to try to consult with those people that they're planning for. Um, so I'm divided on an interest in, in making sure that there's urban planning technical expertise, but also coordination expertise that comes with it. Thanks. Thank you, Rami. Yes, you can. Yeah, so uh, on the urban planning, I've noted down a little bit of uh, of some of the components that I think uh, are very important in terms of not only coordination, but in terms of planning uh, in uh, sustained humanitarian crises and emergencies. So one is there's a, a very big myth and mis there are certain misconceptions within the communities and within the different actors uh, on uh, what is urban planning. Uh, not everybody works on it, not everybody has tools for it, and not everybody sees it as a priority or integrated within different uh, sectors. So the first level of coordination is for everyone to be on the same page, for everyone to understand what urban planning is. And this is a major uh, shift in how the coordination mechanisms can be uh, more effective and uh, can actually achieve the, the impact that we want. The second thing is that whenever we are talking about urban planning, we need to make sure that the resources that are present in this community that we would need are, are there. You know, uh, when we talk about livelihood approaches, we need to see what kind of resources are present within the livelihood approaches or the livelihood value chains uh, that are within this specific, uh, within this specific area. And here, uh, the presence of the organization is very important. It gives a little bit of an overview on what can be uh, what can be done. Uh, the uh, third thing, uh, and I will stop here maybe to allow more, uh, more answers, is that whenever we are talking about urban programming, we need to prioritize what kind of things we need to start with the, inter with the interventions with. In this urban context, uh, such as Zatari, do we work on security first? Do we work on shelter? Do we work on livelihood first? And for example, in Beirut explosion, whenever the response that we started with, we had to prioritize our need, the needs of the communities to start first with the shelter and start with the basic services. And then later on, start with the different other uh, intervention, interventions, such as the psychosocial support for the children and the activities that are uh, that are undergoing. So prioritization helps in setting the grounds as well for the coordination mechanisms to say, okay, we're going to start with this, and then we're going to move forward to other uh, to other sectors. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Yes. Again, I'll try and be quick. Um, I think for me, the key skills which relate again to what Ram, Rami was saying there and, and Melissa as well, I, I think is is negotiation. Uh, I think planners are by nature, well, a, a good planner <laughs> should be should be able to understand that it is always, um, you know, understanding different needs from different groups and, and then trying to be able to uh, prioritize them, as, as Rami was saying. And I, I think listening and compromise, understanding that you don't have the right answer. Uh, the community and, you know, policy frameworks are there to kind of guide what you should be looking for. And therefore, you know, being able to negotiate how to, to prioritize one versus the other um, and where, therefore, to start, um, I think is, is key for me. So negotiation. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Dr. Ozam, and after Dr. Ozam, um, we will uh, we'll hand over to Michaela. We have uh, about two minutes more to end. Thank you. Uh, just to say, totally agree with what Rami mentioned and Jonathan. Yes, absolutely. It's the, the, the priorities number one always, it's how to do with emergency, if I may say, and always my experience with Azatari. Number one priority, by, by the way, was sheltering, but guess what was the second important priority? the safety and security of the aid agencies. Why? Because you have the refugees, they lost the trust, they lost faith, they have kind of trauma, psychological trauma from the war, from the crisis. And, and there was many attack incidents on the Jordanian police. 
So I totally agree. Sometimes this is why sometimes negotiation could be not number one priority, if I may say. Safety, security, and even how to deal with, with AIDS. But maybe this is not the case for informal camps, unfortunately, where sometimes it's just led by the community and then you start and the AIDS came later on. So what I am trying to say, we need to distinguish between camp organized by uh, 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 aid agencies and there are informal camp like the one created by the Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Two different set of priorities, let us put it this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michaela, over to you. Many thanks, Lafayette. Um, I guess my role here is to give like few, uh, give a final remarks that are slightly institutional in tone. I just want to make the audience aware of where the Institute is coming from when engaging with these issues. Um, so there's been a really fascinating um, panel discussion. I want to thank all of you for, for participating in it. Uh, the Institute has been engaging with these issues uh, since at least 2008. Uh, I will share with the public chat some links. Uh, I think uh, one of the thing that, uh, things that Rami just said is, is of capital importance to us, making the humanitarian community better aware of what even planning is, because there is, of course, we have, let's say, a, a small PR problem. Uh, so one of the things, one of the publications that we uh, issued that was already uh, some time back now in 2009 is the Built Environment Professions in Disaster Risk Reduction and Response, a guide for humanitarian agencies. It's slightly outdated when it comes to its uh, framing from a policy perspective, but I still see it being used um, and it's available on the prevention web. And um, after that, uh, as Ola mentioned at the beginning of this se uh, session, in 2016, when the Global Alliance for Urban Crisis uh, was established, the RTPI joined it straight away. And since then, we have been, uh, despite low capacity for engaging forces with some of these very complex and uh, um, issues, we have been um, working with some of the partners in the Global Alliance. And for example, we have contributed to this uh, piece of work led by RADAR, the Urban Competency Framework, where we had um, different actors, humanitarian development, and local government actors in understanding what are the competencies that humanitarians need to operate in cities um, from 2018. And you can see a link uh, in the public chat. And finally, I want to uh, share with you uh, the fact that we have just made available with a soft launch a research report that explores some of the issues that the speakers touched upon that we kind of actually explored today uh, and it's called urbanization displacement and urban planning and uh, all of them in different ways have made very important and generous comments to to the report of course the responsibility for the content entirely of the Institute, but I think this is a great opportunity to share it with everyone that is following us today and to thank you again for your great contributions. And we are very lucky to be able to convene uh, these very uh, important discussions as urbanization and displacement become uh, increasingly complex and intertwined. And since I think we have uh, slightly overrun and we still have uh, a video to show i will give the floor back to the chair to introduce it again quickly and uh, thank you very much on behalf of the institute for being here today thank you michaela uh, we have a video called a story from the east the video is uh, has been um, presented prepared by Dr. Uzam Alwaya for us. Um, and I believe it would be an interesting way to actually close uh, the session today. Thank you very much for attending and we look forward to you participating in our subsequent events and hopefully would we'll have more events focused the on East. the humanitarian conversation. It was a beautiful. Have a great day.
beautiful city where people enjoying simple and peaceful life. Everything was a cause for celebration. Members of the family, neighbors, and friends participated in all activities taking place in public. Long time before cinemas, there was Sanduk al firji the show books that entertain children in the piazza of the city. In the morning time, women would gather around the water fountain to begin a coffee ritual and daily gossip session. In the market, the milker chanted about his fresh milk while milking one of his goats right there. The walk to the fountain had become over time an anticipated special event where women would show of their beautiful dresses. In the piazza, the musical band assembled swords and dubki dancers, young men would, would try to embrace young ladies. After the wedding ceremony, the bridal procession proceed to the groom's house with the musicians, dancers, relatives, and neighbors. In religious ceremony, parents and children made a procession with the children hold lighted candles. At the end of the summer, women would gather in the souk to crush the grapes and strain the juice to make molasses. In particular occasion, we would hear the beat of drum and song of juggling, a performing peer and dancing monkey. Then came the Arab Spring. Protesters occupied the piazza and streets of their city and started a revolution calling for demonstrations. The call for freedom, dignity, and justice were answered through shells and rockets over the head of frightened people. Many were obliged to leave to another city where they settled in tent and have appropriated the place trying to copy and imitate their beloved city and the place. Other were obliged to take the sea uncertain way to reach another city with the hope to find a welcoming place. Being a displaced person in a tent or refugees struggling on borders or returnees trying to rebuild their beloved place. All of them need a welcoming place, a place to feel at home, a place for reconciliation, a place to connect with others, a place to rebuild peace. The challenge then is to create more than a public space where people gather. The real idea is to be able to connect people, to make sure they engage with each other, to use place making as an excuse 
to bring different communities to the same table to achieve one goal, which is peace making, reimagining peace. Thank you very much. Shukran lakum jamian.